Hey, I'm Charles Hoffman from Black Ghost Audio, making a guest appearance on the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. Today, we'll be taking a look at the pros and cons of hardware versus software compressors. Empirical Labs is sponsoring this video, and they loaned me a pair of distressors so that I can show you how they stack up against the company's Arouser plugin, which is a distressor emulation. First, I want to fill you in on the distressor's background and what's led to its success. It's an incredibly popular hardware compressor that finds its way into tons of studios. After that, we'll take a look at a variety of audio examples with and without compression applied, as well as a direct audio comparison between the distressor and a rouser. You can make a distressor behave very similarly to an 1176 or LA-2A, and this is no accident. I had a chance to talk to Dave Durr, who's Empirical Labs founder and the designer of the distressor. He found that a lot of the new hardware being produced in the 80s and 90s didn't have the same color as his favorite vintage gear. At the time, new 1176s weren't being made either. This means you had to buy them secondhand for a premium. Dave set out to create a hardware compressor that provided the same creamy results as his favorite gear from the 60s and 70s, but at a significantly reduced price. At night, after his day job at Eventide, he probed and prodded old hardware and found there were some basic things that separated the new less colored compressors from old classics, including basic circuit topology. He built a few prototypes, compared them with his favorite vintage gear on thousands of sources, and made adjustments until he was comfortable grabbing this new compressor over his Blackface 1176 and LA-2A for studio use. The distressor is also measurably quieter than that vintage gear. Its ability to warm up the cold and brittle tone of digital gear during the early days of digital production is something else that led to its widespread success. It has different distortion modes to choose from that apply tape style saturation that's usually quite subtle and pleasant. Digital gear has come a long way, so it's not always necessary to use saturation now, but these distortion modes are a great way to add a little flavor to vocals, synthesizers, guitars, bass, and drums. Due to its rich sound, variety of features, and versatility, the Distressor is a solid choice if you're looking to buy your first hardware compressor. You see it recommended all the time on Gearspace and other music production forums. You can set super fast attack and release times that other hardware compressors are incapable of. For example, you can use a Distressor to round out the sharp transients found in rap vocals, acoustic guitar, and drums. In the past, AD conversion was something that people thought about more actively than today. Most modern audio interfaces provide up to 24-bit, 192kHz conversion and a significant amount of dynamic range, which is the difference between the quietest and loudest signal the audio interface can process. Back in the day, you'd use a hardware compressor to confine the dynamic range of vocals and guitars prior to AD conversion to avoid distortion. AD conversion has improved significantly, but there are multiple other benefits to owning a hardware compressor. For one, you can record through a hardware compressor, which cuts down on the amount of mixing you need to do in your DAW. Raw vocals often require compression if you produce pop or hip hop, so applying that form of processing on the way in is quite common. Some people also choose to EQ their signal on the way in after applying compression. The trade off is that you can't undo the processing you've applied like you can with a plugin. While this may seem like something negative, it forces you to be diligent at the recording stage of the production process. Instead of recording with the mindset of, I'll fix it later in the mix, a shift occurs and you start thinking, does this sound like a finished product? With some processing applied on the way in, you get a better sense of how your mix will come together. If you're recording a vocalist or instrumentalist, they'll be able to hear a real-time polished version of their performance, providing them with a confidence boost and potentially resulting in a better performance. The vocals in the following audio example were recorded with no processing applied. I'm running them through a hardware distressor using Ableton's external audio effect so that you can hear an accurate A-B comparison. Then I'm cutting away some low end, brightening up the top end, and gently driving the signal using Empirical Labs Big Freak EQ plugin. This will help it cut through the mix. 
I've been thinking, I've been in my head I've been hurting over what you said Thought the lies were done and over now But I guess you'll always let me down I've been thinking, I've been in my head I've been hurting over what you said Thought the lies were done and over now But I guess you'll always let me down There's some measurable things hardware can do that software can't. One example is frequency response. The distressor has a frequency response up to 200 kilohertz, while plugins are often limited to 20 kilohertz. This can come into play when recording with a microphone like a Sankin CO100K that's capable of recording up to 100 kHz. You typically use a microphone like this in a sound design context where you plan to drastically time stretch audio. It's going to help maintain audible high frequency content as the pitch drops. Plugin development has come a long way over the years and the audible difference between hardware and a well-made emulation is usually so small that most people can't hear a difference. We'll do a little side-by-side -side comparison here. I'm going to run the same vocal through the distressor and a rouser using the same settings. Just see if you can pick out any differences at all. Give me the check. Give me your neck. I am a vet. Well, aim for your head, pal. Need me a bag for show or feature. I'm on the floor back then. I was bleaching, shaping the future. I am a teacher. Look like a model. Need to be featured. Easy. Get to it like ASAP. Big fish. I don't play that. So deep in it. Got 10 toes underground. Dog and that straight facts. Ear to the street like I fell over. Boy's cold, but hell's colder. Man, I'm so fuego. Never froze over. Real clicked up. Never fold over. Give me the check. Give me your neck. I am a vet. Well, aim for your head, pal. Need me a bag for show or feature. I'm on the floor back then I was bleaching. Shaping the future, I am a teacher. Look like a model, need to be featured. Easy, get to it like ASAP. Big fish, I don't play that. So deep in it, got 10 toes underground, dog, and that's straight facts. Ear to the street like I fell over. Boy's cold, but hell's colder. Man, I'm so fuego, never froze over. Real clicked up, never fold over. So I can't hear much of a difference, and I like to think I've got pretty fine tuned ears. Perhaps you can hear a difference. If that's the case, is it a $1,350 difference? Your rouser sells for $199, while the distressor sells for $1549. If you want to process stereo signals, you'll need a pair of distressors, making it a $2,850 difference. Some engineers own a golden hardware box, like an old compressor or EQ, with color that varies from device to device, but most people are not buying hardware because it provides a superior sound. We're well beyond that, and a lot of plugins sound on par with the hardware they're meant to emulate, and sometimes provide additional functionality, which is the case with the arouser. If you're recording with a real-time plugin like Universal Audio's Distressor, which you can apply to your signal on the way into your DAW, the workflow is essentially the same as using a hardware compressor. The signal shows up in your DAW with compression applied, so you don't need to apply it later on. On top of that, if you're using a plugin like the arouser in your DAW, you're not limited to a particular number of instances. You could apply it to every track in your project, assuming your CPU can handle it. Hardware does reduce the strain on your CPU, but you can always render your tracks to audio if your project gets too CPU intensive. With plugins, it's easy to reorder devices in your processing chain. All you need to do is drag and drop your audio effects. You can use a patch bay to reconfigure signal routings using hardware, but with a lot of cables plugged in, it's more work to trace the flow of a signal from point A to point B. The ability to recall plugin settings when you load your project is another big advantage that plugins have over hardware. It's always possible to take a photo of your hardware settings or write down the settings you used for a particular project, but recalling those settings is time consuming. Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein were the composers for Stranger Things, and they used a lot of analog synths to write the score. In an interview with them, Michael mentions that he was scared to change the knobs on one of his favorite synths for a year because it was used to create one of the show's themes. If the show required edits, recalling those settings after they'd been changed could have been an issue. Dave Durr said he wanted to get a hardware tone and vibe into the arouser and take advantage of some software-only abilities. There's an attack modification knob, soft clipping control, detector sidechain EQ, bandwidth control, additional LEDs that go up to 30, an 8 to 1 ratio not found on the distressor, and a mix knob. In this audio example, I'm applying parallel compression directly to my drum bus. I'm slamming my drums with heavy compression, a high-pass filter is applied to the detector circuit, and there's some saturation being applied. 
With the mix knob set to 100%, it's going to sound way too compressed, but as I turn the mix knob down, some of those transients will blend back into the signal and result in a thick and punchy final product. A benefit to using Empirical Labs plugins is that they receive constant updates that include new features. Hardware doesn't evolve over time like this. Despite the fact that the arouser comes with all these additional features and it's much cheaper than hardware, people are still buying hardware distressors, so why is that? It seems like plugins can do almost everything that hardware can do and then some. On paper, definitely, but hardware provides an experience that plugins can't match. It really boils down to the fact that turning knobs, pressing buttons, and flipping switches is fun. It's like drawing a picture in Photoshop versus drawing a picture with paintbrushes in real life. The end results could look almost identical, but the creative experience is entirely different. One of the distressor's defining characteristics visually is its big white knobs. Their large size makes them easy to twist. The contrast between the white knobs and black numbers makes dialing in the right settings painless, and there's something about getting your hands on a physical knob that satisfies in a way that wiggling a mouse doesn't. Empirical Labs went through the trouble of trademarking these knobs because they're characteristic of the brand. Now that you've clocked these, you'll notice distressors in the background of studio interviews all the time. An additional reason you might go for hardware is a plug-in emulation doesn't exist. Most staple studio hardware has been modeled by one company or another, but maybe you come across some obscure piece of gear that you love the sound of but can't find in a plugin format. Assuming you want that sound, you only have one option. If you're looking to get your hands on some hardware without killing the fast plugin oriented workflow that you're used to, start with a hardware compressor like a distressor and then maybe add a hardware EQ down the line. The quality of the recordings that you find yourself working with will be significantly higher, allowing you to cut down on mixing time, specifically when it comes to applying processing and setting rough track levels. Thank you again to Empirical Labs for making this video possible. If you learned something new, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.